بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد هبت في الله continue on in our study of بلوغ مرام the كتاب الجامع the um, comprehensive book uh, we reached uh, in the book of uh, Bitter or the book of uh, the book of Edeb of good manners and in this chapter we talked about a group of Ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which dealt with prophetic manners and prophetic mannerisms how the Muslims said ta'amal baynahum that what kind of how, how the Muslims should be with one another and in this group of Ahadith we also talked about other some of the specifics of those mannerisms such as giving salams and responding to sneezes and giving salams uh, in various scenarios such as when uh, uh, you know people are standing and others are sitting and we also talked about how individuals uh, the believers should deal with one another in general and those kind and gentle manners and mannerisms and all of that falls under the importance and emphasizes and and, and and shows the precedence that we should as believers uh, give to our adab, our manners, because people can see your manners. And this is a powerful form of da'wah in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a powerful form of ibadah. And it's a powerful form and a superior way of having your scales on the day of judgment weigh heavy. And the reason being, and how we know this, is because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam said, مَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ أَثْقَلُ فِي مِزَانَ مُؤْمِنْ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ مِنْ حُسْنُ خُلْقِ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُبْغِذُ الْفَحْشَ الْبَرِي The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam said, There isn't a thing which weighs heavier on the scale of the believer on the day of judgment than, excellent, than good manners. And verily Allah hates wicked and sinful speech. So that shows us, that's a qa'ida, that's a, that's a principle on how to interact with people and to remind us when we are going to speak ill. Think about what you're going to say. So these group of ahadith, as all the ahadith we've studied in this uh, book, which is comprehensive, show us how we should act and interact and how we should strive to have those prophetic morals and moral boundaries and ways of interaction and manners and that it will give us success in this life as well as the hereafter and it will exalt the most the highest of characteristics and this is what we need to be striving for ahabatifillah in our studies we reached the hadith 1247 Narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said When one of you puts on his shoes, he should put on the right one first And when he takes them off, he should take off the left one first So that the right shoe should be the first to be put on And the last to be taken off mutafiqan alayhi This is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim And it's a hadith which is a reminder because we We often just put on our shoes take off our shoes, we don't really think about these things, but there is a prophetic edit, uh set of mannerisms to observe. And there's obviously a benefit to that, otherwise the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not have emphasized it. So if nothing else, even if we may or may not uncover the hikmah for something, the wisdom for something, but there is wisdom and there is salvation in following the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this differs with the belief and the creed 
and minhaj or methodology of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah versus some of the other groups. Some of the other groups, they don't give that precedence to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And some of them even totally belittle or totally negate the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially some of the contemporary ones, some of the contemporary secularists and, and others that are supposedly liberal or supposedly modernist Muslims that they almost destroy the ahkam of the Sharia which it was built upon because they go and try to destroy the asl. They destroy the origin and the foundation which is of course the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah but rather they say no we follow the Quran we don't follow the sunnah. But that's a open lie and an open violation because the Quran tells you to follow the Sunnah. How many ayat does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command us to obey Allah and obey His Messenger? So by obedience to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we get uh, salvation. And by following His Prophet Sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, we have success in the dunya wal akhira. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with success in the dunya wal akhira. Uh, from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, We learn, <clears throat> and some of the benefits we gain from this hadith is that this hadith shows us the completion or the, uh, well, the completion of the shark, but also the completeness of the shark. That it is encompassing in our lives, as we've mentioned several ahadith, which also illustrate this, this same point, that the sharia is comprehensive. It, 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 comp it, it entails... And it includes uh, a many, uh, if not all, aspects of our lives. All aspects of our lives in a very general way. There's so everything from how we use the restroom to, as we see, which shoe to put on and which shoe to take off first. And in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam said, "None of you should walk with." Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "When one of you puts on his shoes." He should put on the right one first, and when he takes them off, he should take off the left one first, so that the right should be the first to be put on and the last to be taken off. Mutafakun alayh. So the Prophet is letting us know to begin with the right. This is from prophetic adab and manners, that we should begin with the right, that the right has a, 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 a you know, is given preference, uh, and that we take off our shoe with the uh, uh, with the left. So this hadith illustrates for us the completeness of the shara. Uh, also, this hadith illustrates for us the preference and the superiority, if you will, of the right and giving preference to your right. And giving preference to your right when you are doing things which are good and things that are clean and so forth. Meaning, <coughs> meaning, for example, that uh, we use as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, or as Aisha Radiallahu Ta'ala Anna said about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, the Prophet وسلم, used to begin with the right with combing his hair, with putting on his shoes. Uh, and and in all, all of his affairs, he would begin with the right, those things which are, uh, which have goodness. Also, we shake with which hand? We shake with the right hand. So, <clears throat> And when we have to clean ourselves, we use the left. So it shows us the right has a higher status for the, for the mu'min. Uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is also, it shows that it is per, uh, permissible, of course, not to wear sandals. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were talking about sandals and that's what was common for them. And you find that common in many of the uh, places where the, the climates are very hot. Obviously, in places where they're very cold, they don't wear sandals. And so it is not necessarily uh, necessary to wear sandals. And it is permissible, of course, to leave off sandals. 
Uh, and that's one of the things uh, Ben Othaymin, he points out with regards to this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. In the next hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, narrated Abu Huraira, Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu, Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, None of you should walk with one shoe. One must either wear both shoes or remove both. Mutafakun Alayhi. This is a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, none of you should walk with one shoe. One must either wear both or remove both. So here, this also is in accordance with the hadith in which we just studied and shows us that from the adab, uh, the prophetic mannerisms that we should observe is that we should, of course, not be <coughs> wearing just one shoe and walking around. Uh, and so we should either wear our shoes, both shoes, or we remove both shoes. And again, this of course goes with if there's a dorora, if there's some sort of necessity, or someone who has uh, one leg, or whatever the case may be, which also falls under that dorora or that necessity, then of course this is a different scenario, and this is of course completely permissible and understandable. Likewise, uh, someone who's injured. Okay, they, they, one foot is injured, so maybe they're, they're unable to wear a shoe. Then this is perfectly uh, permissible and there is no haraj in that. What we learn from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this prophetic uh, mannerisms, <coughs> prophetic mannerism, uh, we learn the mess uh, one of the benefits is that this hadith shows us the nahi, the prohibition of wearing a, uh, wearing one shoe. Uh, on, 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 on one leg and that we should either wear our shoes both of them or remove both of them uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this hadith also shows us the permissibility of either wearing the, the sandals or not wearing them that it's all jahiz, it's all uh, permissible, and there is no, uh, you know, it, it doesn't uh, pertain to any hukum in the shar as far as wearing the sandals, but the hukum comes in is that you should make sure you have either two shoes or you have no shoes, but you should not uh, be walking around, and we see no faida or no benefit, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, in someone even... Uh, being in such a, a state in general and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best in the next hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam narrated Ibn Umar uh, <coughs> radiallahu ta'ala in Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Allah will not look on the day of resurrection at the person who trails his garment out of arrogance or public with tafakun alayhi this is a very uh important hadith because there's a lot of controversy around it and you find that many people uh, have confusion about this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so it's a great ni'mah minni amillah that we have the opportunity to see what Ahl al-Ilm uh, what they have what they mention in the study of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Alaihi Wasallam so uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma qal qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yandhuru allahu ila man jarra thawbuhu khuyalan khuyala mutafakun alayhi the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said as uh, it was narrated by uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma uh, that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh, that Allah will not look to the one who drags his garment uh, out of uh, arrogance. So this is very important for us to understand. Uh, and we're going to look at this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. So from the fawaid of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's a fa'idah uh, aqidi. There's a fa'idah, a benefit which pertains to aqidah or creed. And this uh, benefit is the first benefit that Ben Othaymin mentioned. He says, Ithbat linadr lillahi azza wa jal. That this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the benefits uh, is that 
this hadith affirms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sees his servant. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the sifa or the attribute of another. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees his servant. And that this is something uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this, that this is from the uh, ni'mah uh, from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will uh, have this uh, another that he will see and, 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 and give his, his servants uh, uh, that he will look to his slaves and that he will subhanahu wa ta'ala encompass them with mercy and uh and you know this 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 gentleness and protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereas the one who disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they won't have this uh this uh faida or this uh this fadila this greatness and this superiority that the one who obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and does not drag his garment below his ankles as the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh mentioned and also we learn uh, <clears throat> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> on the day of judgment those people who were miserly and disobedient wicked sinners that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment will put a hijab uh, between him and them so they will not be able to see their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and he will not look to them because of their disobedience and that that is takreem when the when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking sees his servant and acknowledges his servant subhanahu wa ta'ala but when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts this hijab because of the disobedience that an individual has done, then this is a type of punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al Kareem, Kalla innuhum arrabbihim yawmaidin la mahjuboon. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, nay, rather, uh, from their Lord on that day, they will be. There will be a hijab, you know, they will be covered, uh, you know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look to them. And they will not be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is a type of punishment. Wallahu musta'an, may Allah protect us from that. Ameen, ya rabbil alameen. Another benefit of this hadith is that the one who drags his garment, and this is in reference to the man, because the, in this regard, men and female have some distinction in their dress. So again, we're talking about men dragging their garment, we're not talking about women, because the women, this is a, in fact, a good characteristic that they are covering themselves. Uh, and so, for the men, uh, we see, and this is a fayda from this hadith, is that the one who drags his garment, uh, that this is, uh, and, and he drags his garment out of arrogance, so it's muqayyid here that he does it out of arrogance, that this is one of the major sins. And the reason we know it's a major sin, and the people don't really, they take it so lightly, is because there is a wa'id which is attached to this. There is a wa'id which is attached to this. And, meaning there's a punishment which is attached to this. And every sin which is mentioned that there is some sort of punishment with it, is evidence that is from one it's from one of the major sins. And may Allah protect us from it. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. And forgive us of our shortcomings with regards to it. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith <coughs> is uh, as Ben Uthaymeen he says and he and we just mentioned that it's muqayyid it's restricted that the one who drags his garment without arrogance then he is not deserving of this punishment.
of this, you know, of this punishment. And this is what we understand from this hadith. And, and the restriction that is mentioned. Uh, and Ben Othaymin mentions in his discussion of this, he says, however, what remains is looking at this ruling. Is it, is it uh, haram or not? And because uh, this action is a haram action, Uh, you know, uh, er, er, ben Othi, ben Othi, mean, he mentions <laughs> so if a person does it unintentionally meaning they didn't intend to drag their garment and have their garment below their ankles and they weren't committed to that. You know, that wasn't an action that they were striving to do. So they had no intention to do this. And he mentions that they, they raise their garment. So this is very important that they raise their garment when they're alerted to it. They're, they're striving to practice that. Then this person, there's no, there's nothing muharram about this. This is, you know, this situation is, uh, is not a, uh, uh, you know, is not sinful. Okay, this person, they did it unintentionally. Okay, uh, and the Dalil, he mentions the evidence for this is the hadith, is, is a hadith with, in which Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, inna ahad, inna ahad, shaqi izari, yastarhi alayya illa an atta'ahaduhu. فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم له إنك لس لست مما يصنع ذلك خيالا. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, Abu Bakr described his condition that because his garment was long and it was it was dragging and he said you know I didn't intend to do that now you know I didn't intend this. Ya, um, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Affirmed That Abu Bakr Did not do that Out of arrogance He said Innaka lasta mimma yasna Thalika Khayala You are not from those Who do that Out of arrogance Radi Allahu Tala Anhu So here We see That uh, The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Didn't uh, uh, Berate him Or uh, punish him or, 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 you know, say anything in a harsh way. He, he affirmed for him that you didn't do this out of arrogance. This, is, this doesn't include you. This includes those people who are arrogant. So it shows us that arrogance, doing that out of arrogance, and intentionally, when you know it's not permissible, then this is, uh, this is where a person uh, is, uh, you know, sinful. And what affirms for the, uh, us this hukum is that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said in another hadith, مَا أَسْفَلَ مِنْ كَعْبَيْنِ مِنَ الْإِزَارِ فَفِي النَّارِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in another hadith, he said that which is lower than the ankles uh, from your, your garment, and he mentioned the izar, then it is in the fire. So, from that hadith as well as this hadith, it lets us know that it affirms for us that hukum that this is impermissible. Uh, so there are essentially three different statuses, if you will. There is the first status that if a person wears their garment above their their ankles, then of course this is jayas. This is what is matlub. This is what is. Uh, permissible, but it's also what is uh, recommended or what we're trying to achieve that we should follow the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, because he وسلم, ordered us to follow this example. It wasn't something that was just recommended or something, but it is a, uh, you know, the opposite was the case that it was shown that this is a prohibition for the one who drags the garment. And we have these two ahadith we just mentioned. So, 
that's the first uh, scenario or condition, if you will. The second scenario is if a person wears their garment below their ankles without arrogance, then this is uh, also this is impermissible, and rather it is one of the major sins. Okay, the person who does it and they do it, they're not doing it out of arrogance, but uh, perhaps. Uh, ben Othemin, he didn't mention other than this, but he already mentioned that prior to this, that uh, so perhaps it would be useful or we could say that there's even a fourth scenario. So there's one who drags the garment without arrogance, but they're still in disobedience to a law. But then there's one. What about the one who didn't intend to do that? Not intend to arrogance, but they didn't intend to drag their garment. But their garment, it fell. Their bro belt, belt broke. They're in some other scenario. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Then this person, uh, as, as we mentioned, and as we mentioned from the hadith about Abu Bakr, that they do not fall under that, uh, you know, that sinfulness. And, and then the third scenario is the one who does it out of arrogance. And they are clearly in disobedience to Allah and have fallen into a major sin even though we take it lightly and we don't see it as a major sin. And there are so many other narrations the Prophet Wasallam mentioned that the one who uh, carries tails and the one whose garment is long that they are some of the people who have done uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look to them on, the, on Yom Al-Qiyamah. So that, that's very strong. That's a very strong wa'id. So it lets us know and it affirms for us that we need to get uh, proper with regards to our garment and observe that prophetic mannerisms and not become lazy with regards to it, but rather be vigilant in practicing it because we just have so many strong nasus which show us that it is impermissible. It's very, it's very strong. It's not a light prohibition. If it was something uh, that was optional or the a hadith let us know that it was optional and that it wasn't serious, then yes. And if it was just restricted to the arrogance, then that would be something different. But rather, we see that it's it's very uh, strong and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best with regards to this uh, prophetic mannerism. In the next group of ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, they deal with the topic of the adab or the manners, uh, the prophetic manners of eating. And uh, what kind of adab that the mu'min should possess when eating and drinking uh, and the mannerisms pertinent to that. And something relevant for us is the importance in general of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and even these things which we from our logic or from our prior backgrounds many of us don't see the relevance for. They may not seem always relevant to uh, individuals who don't have a background, an, an Islamic background. So often people may be left questioning. But that is a challenge and meaning that they have some deficiency in their usul, in their foundation of understanding uh, the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that we are ordered to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in everything. And that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with the complete religion of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And these matters are not insignificant. And how we know that because the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam emphasized them and uh, was repetitive in his emphasis and consistent in emphasizing these sunan. So we should never take these things lightly and we should realize that if there's a, a, a wa'id, a punishment mentioned with something, then of course then that means it is a, uh, if, by doing that or leaving that action, then it is sinful. 
leaving the thing that is pro, uh, uh, doing the thing which is prohibited, and leaving off which is wajib. And as we mentioned, al amr yufid al wujub that a command uh, shows that something is an obligation, and when something is an obligation, that means you will be rewarded for doing it, and you'll be punished for leaving it. So this is something for us to reflect on when it comes to even these prophetic adab. And as the scholars of Ahl Sunnah have written extensively uh, in their books about just about manners and just about even the way and the look even of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he looked, how his hair was, what his skin tone was, and things of this nature, the ulama of Ahl Hadith, they did not leave anything. And they strove their utmost to preserve these manners and the way of the Prophet Sallallahu in his Sunnah Khalqiya wa Khulqiya wa or Khilqiya and all his wa Takririya and all of his other uh aspects of the sunnah, his, his statements, his actions, the things he uh, allowed, you know, that we know are permissible because they were done in his presence and he didn't make, uh, he didn't negate them or he didn't reject them or speak out against them. And also the things that even have to do with how he was, sallallahu alayhi Wasallam. So they have relevance for us, and that's a reminder for us, and that we should be conscious of that when studying these this bab of Adam. So in Hadith 1250, narrated Ibn Umar anhu, uh, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, When any one of you eats, he should eat with his right hand. And when he drinks, he should drink with his right hand. For the devil eats and drinks with his left hand, uh, and Muslim uh, reported it. So this hadith shows us many, many benefits, and again, it affirms for us the prophetic manners with re mannerisms with regards to eating and drinking. And it shows us that the man mannerisms that uh, go against that or contradict those prophetic mannerisms are the mannerisms literally of the shaitan. Because the Prophet had said in this hadith, he said, for the devil eats and drinks with his left hand. So that should be a stern uh, reminder for us, a firm reminder for us, and a warning to not resemble the worst of creation. Just from that uh, perspective of not resembling the most evil of creation, the biggest of the disbelievers, which is the shaitan, the most cursed. And so, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a, a, a authentic hadith, Men tashabbaha biqomin fuhuwa minhum, whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. So even this adab, by going against the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu by using the left, because the Prophet Sallallahu affirmed that the shaitan uses the left and eats with the left and drinks with the left, that by copying or imitating or doing that action, that this is a type of imitation. And so it shows us the danger, that there's no doubt there's a resemblance. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Men Whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. So in order to avoid being like the worst of creation, we should observe this prophetic mannerism. And that's a reminder for myself and my brothers and sisters. So, uh, from this hadith, some of the fawaid, uh, the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is first, it shows that from the Islamic uh, adab is ikram al yameen that it is being respectful and given precedence and honor to the right hand or to the right in general because as we mentioned in another hadith prior to this 
And we said that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, where she said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ترجوله وطهوره وفي شأنه كله كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم تيمن في تناعله وترجوله و في شأنه كله أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أو كما قال قالت عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها that she رضي الله تعالى عنها said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to uh, you know put his shoes uh, on with his right he used to comb his hair with his right uh, and he would uh, in all of his affairs that he would use his right showing that those things so that illustrates for us the ikram al yameen or the the given precedence and the respect for the right and we see that even in when we give salams to people when we greet one another uh, regardless of whoever we we greet from amongst the lawful people to greet uh, we shake the hands with the right hand because we use the left hand for ikramakum Allah, we use it for uh, our toilet manners, relieving ourselves, and we use our left to clean ourselves with. So it shows us that from this hadith that the fact that we eat with the right is an illustration of the importance and that it is uh, that it is from the Prophet mannerisms and that it is uh, the respect that there must be given respect for the right hand and precedence in using your right hand for those things which are good, eating, drinking, uh, even combing the hair, even uh, putting on the shoes with the right first, uh, and other activities, and those things which, uh, and beginning with your uh, tahara even. Whereas the things such as cleaning oneself, we do with the left hand. Another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this hadith affirms for us the wujub al-akl bil yameen the obligation to eat uh, with uh, with uh, with the right hand and This comes from, there are two principles at play at hand here when we look at this analysis. Because as we mentioned prior to this, al-emr yufid al-wujub, that a command shows that something is an obligation. So that's the asal of the, uh, the origin of, um, or, or a foundation principle of when there's a command in the shar, meaning when there's a command in the Quran or a command in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. It shows that, that it's an obligation. And uh, the scholars have also deduced a, a very important principle, which is that the Al-Amr fil Adab Yudilla ala istihbab. That when there's a command and it relates to uh, Adab, you know, manners, that that is an illustration that uh, it shows that that adab is in its origin a mustahab. So that's another important qaida. So how do we deal with these two qa'id or these, this qa'idatan uh, at the same time, these two principles that seem to uh, have some tension in how we can practice this? We deal with this, this, this qa'idatan, these two principles, by first, that the first principle, as we said, al emr yufid al wujub, and since the Prophet ﷺ commanded that this shows that it is uh, the asal is that it's an obligation, but the fact that this is a command in adab, then the scholars have deduced from other nusuls 
that that is mustahab. So why do we say that, that, that this adab is wajib? We say that this adab is wajib, as Ibn Uthameen and those ulama prior to him who had this manak manakasha ilmiya, they say that because in the hadith itself, the Prophet ﷺ said the shaitan eats with the uh, left. So therefore, illustrating, taking that command from mustahab to wajib, because it being an obligation to flee and run from what the shaitan does and resembling the shaitan. So from that uh, waj, or in that, uh, with that set, that reasoning, those the scholars uh, that hold that this is an obligation, this adab, hold it for that reason. Uh, in another uh, narration, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يأكل بشماله ولا يشرب بشماله. So here the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this affirms that is that he sallallahu alaihi wasallam made nahi a, a strong nahi a strong prohibition uh, with regards. He says, do not eat with the the left and do not eat with the uh, and do not drink with the left. So here's he sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, Prohibited eating and drinking with the left. So, and then again, as we go back to that qaida, the 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 general principle is that a nahi yafida tahrim is that there when there's a prohibition, it shows that something is a uh, uh, something is prohibited, something is haram that we cannot do. So from that, from those, from those uh, nasus, uh, the scholars. Uh, deduce that that uh, from that hadith that it is um, uh, the 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 wujub the the obligation to uh, eat and drink with the uh, right. Uh, another important point with regards to that is uh, another qaida that the ulama deduce uh, from the shara from the, the evidences of the Book of Allah and the Sunnah, the Message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that Al-Wajib Yasqut Yasqut Mal Ajiz that an obligation, something that's obligatory that it is no longer an obligation if someone has Ajiz meaning someone is unable to fulfill that so that's very important for us and that makes gives us insight into the Shara into the, the Islamic Sharia in general and into our obligations and prohibitions. And it makes it easier for us to practice that when something is a wajib, we know we have to uh, uh, establish the prayer and we should stand up, uh, we should stand for the prayer. But if someone is ajiz, if someone is unable to, then of course they can sit. And if they're unable to do that, then they can pray laying on their side. And if they are unable to actively lay on their side, their side, uh, their side, uh, their side, uh, then they can also take the uh, uh, you know pray laying down. So this uh, is very important for us to to have that uh, that uh, knowledge, and that makes our practice much uh, easier. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this hadith also shows the tahrim ashrab bishimal, the impermissibility of drinking with the left. So as we mentioned, it affirms for us the obligation to eat and drink with the right. And it also shows us, we also learn from this hadith, the prohibition of eating and drinking with the left, as we, we've already talked about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran about uh, what we said uh, previously about the edges, about not having the ability, and that and the, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we have uh, described everything for you. 
you know, detailed everything for you that uh, is prohibited for you, except that which you are forced to do. So how does this apply to what we're talking about, about tahrim, uh, the, the impermissibility of drinking with the, the left, meaning that if someone is unable to use the right, then for them, it's permissible to use the left. So if they have ajiz, again, if they have the inability, so for example, someone who's paralyzed in the right, someone who's very sick and they can't use their right, whatever the case may be, which is uh, uh, an absolute dorora, an absolute, some, uh, something that absolutely prohibits them from being able to use that, then this is, uh, this fits under ajiz, and they are able to use the left uh, out of this uh, this dorora, this necessity. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith shows that the uh, shaitan, as we mentioned, uh, eats and drinks with the left. And there is many evidences aside from this hadith, but it suffices us just this hadith, which is a Sahih Muslim, to show us that the, the uh, shaitan uh, eats and drinks with the left. And so, as we mentioned prior to this, that the hadith uh, uh, the, of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, Men tashabba bi minhum, that whoever resembles the people he is from them, this alone should be sufficient for us to avoid that and, and affirms for us the tahrim of that practice, that whoever resembles the people, then he is from them. We do not want to be in any likeness with the shaitan, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Ameen. Wa'iyadhi billah wa'iyakum. Min al-shaitan, min al-shaitan al-rajim. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith also shows us the prohibition uh, in resembling the disbelievers. And and that's because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, mentioned and uh, for us to acknowledge and practice and avoid being away from uh, or to implement by being away from resembling the shaitan. And that goes back to the hadith I, I mentioned, minhum. whoever resembles a people, then he is from them. And none of us wants to be from the shaitan or the shayateen. Uh, another last benefit of this hadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam also shows us the uh, the excellent way of advising uh, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam had, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised his ummah, uh, gave his ummah guidance, and was a light and a, and a guide for his ummah, and commanded them with those things which they are commanded with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and prohibited them with those things which they are prohibited from by Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, in the next hadith, uh, narrated uh, Amr ibn Shu'ib radiallahu ta'ala anhu on his father's authority that his grandfather narrated Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, eat, drink, wear clothes, and give sadaqah without extravagance or pride. Uh, Abu Dawood and Ahmed reported it. Al Bukhari mentioned it as a mu'allak, meaning a broken chain from the side of the hadith collector. Uh, in this hadith, we see that it affirms many uh, important uh, mannerisms that we should uh, observe. Uh, and, uh, observe. And from those manners, because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, eat, drink, wear clothes, and give sadaqah without extravagance or pride. So here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was ordering the Muslim to be in the middle, to not be extravagant, don't be wasteful. And as I mentioned prior to this, that, you know, you see that unfortunately a disease that has happened to many of the Muslims, especially those who are well off, is it become so extravagant and so wasteful. They they have to have the th so many things to show off even if they're in reality broke. 
people take debt to go on vacations. People take pictures of their food on Snapchat and then leave most of it to show that they are, it's beneath them to finish their plate, which is the exact opposite of all the mannerisms we just studied in this chapter alone about eating, about finishing your food, about licking your fingers. Instead, the people are so become so proud and so extravagant and wasteful that they are too proud to even finish their food, even finish half of their food. So this shows how shameful and how we've begun to resemble the practices of the Shealtin, uh, the wealthy and extravagant amongst the Shealtin. Instead of following the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. And that is to not be extravagant and on the other hand, uh, to, to be between the two poles, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, or proud. So pride here can also be, uh, you know, uh, also a type of, uh, you know, of course, arrogance, but also it's a warning against being, being miserly because there are other narrations uh, that we have of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showing us the negative and showing us that it's muharram, it's impermissible to be, of course, to have israf as we see and to have also to be uh, israf meaning wastefulness and also to be uh, miserly. And we have many ayat in the Quran also that warn us against that uh, that characteristic, which is methamum, you know, a, a sinful characteristic. So in this hadith, some of the benefits we get from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is first, this hadith shows us that, of course, that a person when they're eating, when they're drinking, when they are dressing, and when they give charity even, that they should do it in a manner not to show pride and arrogance and not to be, uh, uh, also to be wasteful. No israf, not being wasteful. And so this shows us that a person should be between those poles, that a person should not be uh, wasteful and prideful and arrogant and not being miserly as well. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us, it also points us, points out that the, uh, some of the dhururiyat, meaning those things which are necessities in this life as well as the hereafter. For example, all of us know we need food and drink to live. And we need that food and drink also to help us. That, that helps us in our, our, our bodies. It helps us in our intellect, intellectual capacity. And it helps us in our religion. Because both of those things help us uh, practice our deen better. And fulfill our duties to Allah Azza wa Jal. So it, in fact, these dururiyat, uh, you know, and also clothing, of course. We need clothing. We need to properly uh, clothe ourselves in a halal way, covering our aura, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, as far as the mannerisms in wearing and the what is the aura and what is the uh, the places that should be covered with the men and the women. So this also is an ishara or points out the dururiyat of the dunya and the akhirah, the the necessities of the this life as well as the hereafter, and even how they interrelate. Uh, another, uh, and, and, and specifically related to the Akhirah, is also, as a Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, that we need, we need the Sadaqah. We need Sadaqah. Sadaqah, it, uh, it purifies your wealth and it removes your sins. Uh, so we need that. It's a spiritual purification as well. So the Sadaqah, to be able to part with your wealth uh, for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to assist others, that this is, this is nothing but khair comes from that. And that is a benefit for your akhirah. Uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is this hadith uh, also shows us the obligation to avoid being extravagant 
and to avoid being arrogant and boastful. And this also goes back to the hadith we mentioned about even being boastful in your garment, especially for men, by being uh, dragging your garment, having your having isbal, uh, meaning to have your wear your garments below your ankles, uh, and especially dragging your your garment uh, on the on the ground with pride, because this is something. Uh, that you still find in the in the jahiliya that people uh, e even in places like America where the culture is very different than the Arabs and how they do it, but you find that in many cultures that having a very long garment, very long robe, and what have you, that this was a sign of uh, of arrogance and pride and status, and we find this even with people having uh, not as much in this time but even in this time people sag their pants you know in some cultures and in some societies you know so they wear their pants so they deliberately drag on the ground and they uh also show their uh economical a lot of their backside and, and and this may be for men and women so it shows the people have lost their way and and in fact to the extent it will show their aura so you can see how this has mukhalifa in, in many ways, but uh, the hadith refers to, that we were referring to prior to this, was referring to the arrogance of the people in how they, uh, in the men specifically, how they wear their garment below the ankles. Uh, a last uh, point I want to mention, this type of extravagance also can apply to the women if they have such a beautiful garment that it, violates the hijab that everyone is looking because they are actually calling attention to them themselves and they're actually not covering properly perhaps perhaps they have all kind of designs and extravagant things to show themselves instead of actually cover themselves and in fact what we find now in many of the muslim countries in amongst the muslims in general wherever they may be that uh, unfortunately many of the sisters that they don't wear hijab properly. In fact, their garments will be open. It becomes a fashion statement. You have many places, even in places like Saudi Arabia and other places where women, they'll wear their abaya totally open. That's a fashion thing. And part of the fashion is to keep your hair, keep your, uh, what do you call it, your bangs showing. And, you know, have the hijab up to here or whatever the case may be. SubhanAllah. So it shows that this is a type of, uh, out of perhaps violating hijab out of pride or a type of extravagance and, and arrogance. Well, Allah understand. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself with the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.